Good day, ladies and gents. Welcome to our section on loading. And we're going to be looking now in this video at loads and load combination, looking at how do you sort of simplify what happens in the real world to a real building into a bunch of equations that you can apply. Because at the end of the day, as structural engineers, we don't exactly know what's going to happen to the building uh, that you're designing. I mean, to the building that you're sitting in right now, wherever you are. We will design it for a 50-year period, Let, well, normally, and you'll see there are different periods we can design for, but we don't exactly know what is going to happen during that period, what will be the worst-case scenario that could occur in its lifetime. So we have simplified, codified examples, and well, codified guidelines that we will apply to try to get to an approximate worst-case condition that we can use to then safely design our building. But one thing to remember is that all of this is to approximate real-world behavior into a simple procedure we can apply to a building to get axial loads and bending moments and the likes to then start designing our building. With that, let's start getting into things. So, looking at the lecture for today, we're first going to have, have a look at why build a structure, then limit state in terms of serviceability, ultimate other limit states, considering load cases, load combinations, permanent dead loads, imposed loads, wind loading, etc. So uh, we're going to, um, these topics are going to be split up over a number of lectures though, with us co covering the first few topics now. So, firstly, in terms of the course, there is, you will see something called Tutorial Zero, a Tutorial Naught. Go have a look at that. That begs a lot of questions in terms of design, understanding concepts, etc. So, start doing it. Uh, those of you who are not on campus will struggle a bit, but start having a look at it. And if you can start thinking through the questions posed to you in that uh, tutorial, it will help you quite a bit, especially in the second half of this course and just with understanding general structural behavior. We will then go and go through it later into the course. And also now, the next time you go into a big grocery shop with ex both steelwork, look up and see if you can start understanding how the structure fits together. Start looking at the steel structures you come into contact with on a daily basis and see why they are designed as they are. Where are the bolts? Why are things put together as they have shown? And from that, hopefully it will assist with your learning. Now, uh, just in terms of a, a background, I find this quite a useful uh, statement or, or quote. Structural engineering is the art of molding materials we don't wholly understand into shapes we can't fully analyze so as to withstand forces we can't really assess in such a way that the community at large has no reason to expect to suspect the extent of our ignorance. And when you start designing real buildings with lots of uncertainties and changes and, you know, questionable quality on construction sites, you'll start understanding this quote a little bit better. But also it tells you, please don't give answers to six decimal places. When you start doing that, it shows you don't have appreciation of the, what level of certainty we actually have, because there is quite high uncertainty in real buildings. As I mentioned earlier, what is the worst case loading in a 50 year period in the building you're sitting in? And we can't accurately quantify that. We have no idea. But we can approximate it as a 300 kilogram, a 3 kPa load, and then use that for design. But the, the loads we are using are sort of rounded off and approximated at best. It And also, it is not possible to say that a structure will never fail, but we can say with certainty the chance of failure is acceptably low. We can say, yes, this is designed according to South African standards, but if someone you know, flies a plane into our building, it's not going to stand up. So, well, except if you're maybe building some fancy high-rise and it's specifically designed for, for airplanes. But in general, you are not saying it will never fail. It's just that in general usage, it's sufficiently safe. And what we do in terms of that is... There's a basis in reliability. Now, reliability is used. Reliability theory is used to calibrate design codes and provide a sound basis for addressing uncertainties. Partial material factors and load factors are adjusted to ensure the probability of failure is low. So now, if you are thinking of, let's say, designing a column, and uh, there are a couple of things that vary with that column. Firstly, you'll find the steel um, the steel strength. You order 355 steel, but normally what ra lands up on site is often 60 MPa, stronger than that. You have a bell curve, approximately, of steel strength. And so, in reality, 
you may have a 410 MPA. You've assumed pinned pinned condition, but maybe it's fixed pinned, maybe it's not. You assume it to be a certain amount of straightness, but maybe it you know, didn't quite fit on site, so they hit it with a four pound hammer and then it fitted. So there are a variety of things that happen, and our resistance is not actually a single number, but a distribution. If you deliver a thousand columns to site, and they come from a thousand different factories with a bunch of different end conditions, you will have a distribution of strength. But we want to be safe, so we use a lower bound. So on average, let's say our the resistance of our thousand columns is there, but we will actually take a lower bound strength somewhere down there. And so we will reduce the strength. And so normally one of the ways you'll see is our, our material factor is 0.90. We only use 90% of our steel strength. The same thing happens with our loading. Now, we let's say now have a thousand buildings for your thousand columns and in those buildings there's a whole variety of loads. Some buildings in their life have very light loads, uh, some get you know, almost overloaded at times. And so we have a distribution of all the different possible load cases. But we don't want to take an average. An average is too unconservative. So we have an upper bound uh, load that we we use. So that is our design load, our design effect, E subscript D, and our design resistance is RD. So whenever you do a calculation and you say the load is 100 kilonewtons, what you're actually saying is the load is 100 kilonewtons at some um, value here. It's an upper bound of all the different. It's not an average value, it's an upper bound. And the same thing with your resistance, your resistance is a lower bound. And if we take the difference between those, we have some sort of distribution and our probability of failure is down here. And this is linked to something called a beta value. And uh, we're not going to cover this really undergraduate. But what you will find is that what you need to do is make sure that this beta value is sufficiently or well, sufficient to have a certain amount of safety. And you, you never actually see this beta value. This is done in the background, in the research and development. But the, co the, the partial factors you get given will um, try make that happen. For instance, you have a 1.6 factor for impose loads and 1.2 factor for uh, permanent loads and that will shift you from there to there. So now moving along with that, we also now have, no, there can be multiple wind load cases which you'll see later. There can be multiple imposed load cases, easy load on roof but not inside, load on roof and inside. For some structural elements permanent and imposed loads may be favorable while for other loads they are unfavorable. We now, in our course, we're typically not going to consider the equilibrium load case, although it's a major factor when designing um, foundations of light structures and when rigid body motion needs to be considered. So just as a just keep this at the back of your mind, this idea of favorable and unfavorable. You should remember this from uh, concrete design, but uh, we'll have a brief look at that soon. So just think about this building here and all the different conditions that could occur with it. So let's say now you've got some apartments, some businesses, and some shops. And you also now have a wind turbine on top. You can have wind load that acts on this, but you could have wind load from one direction. You could have wind load from another direction. You could have a grand opening of the shops, and then the shops get full, and that's the same time, well, the grand opening of the business and the building and suddenly you have lots of people throughout the building or you have a rebuild of the apartments at some stage they strip them out and then they pack all sorts of materials in one room while they you know, rebuild the other and we need to now somehow approximate all of that and also even we may have a hoist as I was just showing you you've got some hoist and now it lifts up let's say motors and gearboxes for the lift or something else or it lifts items into the businesses and now start thinking about those we're going to design each one for let's say the worst load in 50 or 100 years but what's the chance of them occurring at the same time so for instance what's the chance of the grand opening of the building where they 
people are packed inside everywhere and there's sales and the shops and whatever else is happening so the building's packed and the you know the stocks have been filled so the storerooms are packed to capacity but what's the chance of the building being chock-a-block full at the same time the worst wind in 50 years blows that is fairly low so those are uncorrelated those do not occur at the same time typically they are uncorrelated that they do not um, will typically not be linked together the one does not lead to the other but for instance maybe when we've got the worst wind load could we have the worst wind turbine load yes possibly it depends on how the wind turbines operate. Sometimes the wind turbines shut down when, they, when the wind speed blows too much. So then they would be uncorrelated, but you'd need more information from the, the wind turbine supplier. And so think about these now. What do we add up? Because we can't just blindly add them all together. I mean, I have heard of this. I won't say where, but I have heard of a project where it was quite a big, strategic, dangerous building. And so they had a seismic load, and then they had a fire load, and then they had a you know, massive wind load, and, and they just kind of added them all on top of each other. So, I mean, it was a very safe structure, but the chance of a you know, massive wind and a fire and an earthquake all at the same time is pretty much you know, non-existent. Um, at that stage, it's probably the end of the world or something. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's not something you would normally design for, or if you do, you're just going to have a really, really, really expensive structure. So... When it comes to that, we've got various guidelines, and I'm going to start talking you through how we approach them from SANS 10160 Part 1, and you'll see i am provided some sections of SANS 10160 here, but um, uh, we're primarily in class the code you need is 10160 Part 3. So our Part 1, our basis and loading of design covers building structures, industrial structures, and then it does not cover a whole bunch of stuff. Actions due to fire, um, internal pressures, hydrodynamic chimneys, bridges, etc., etc. So don't go use this code to design a bridge. Don't go use this to design actions due to internal, external explosions. Yeah? So just, just be careful. Every code has a scope and don't use it where it's not designed for. Now, when we use this this code, I've been referring to well, um, the, this design life of our building. And typically, we will design for a 50-year period. That is most buildings. Most buildings are 50-year period. Building structures and unknown co um, other common structures. But there are times where it makes sense either to be more conservative and design for higher loads or less conservative and design for lower loads. For instance, if you've got a temporary structure, it's, you know, it's the big gazebos that are outside the engineering building at open day and you know, orientation week, etc. You would design that for a 10-year period. Now, it's, it sort of makes sense. It's only up there for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and you would design it for the, first, the worst wind in, in 10 years. But uh, let's say now it's a uh, a structure with replaceable parts or it's agricultural structure I mean if it's storing your hay and it's in the middle of the field and it gets a bit damaged maybe that's okay so uh, then you've got a structure with a low consequence of failure um, you would you would design that but to be perfectly honest often the, the, the differential cost I would normally just design everything for 50 years unless the client specifically is really trying to cut the budget as fine as possible um, then what you've got is uh, building structures designated as essential facilities having post-disaster functions. If something bad happens and it's still gone, you don't want to have to fix it up. If the worst wind comes along in 50 years and you, it needs to keep going, um, hospitals, communication, fire, rescue, etc., you, um, you design it for 400 years. Um, this would not cover, for instance, specialist things, nuclear facilities, etc. Now when we start taking our, our loads, we need to start combining them. And to be perfectly honest, when I first saw these equations, I got a bit confused. Uh, I learned to design with the old loading code, and then I got exposed to the wind load, the new code, and uh, you see these sorts of equations, think, how on earth does this work? And... Uh, it's actually not as bad as you think once you break this down. So this equation here gives us how do you combine a bunch of loads into a design scenario. And firstly, we're not going to consider a whole bunch of these. P is a pre-stressing force. We're not covering pre-stressing. We're not covering accidental loads. And uh, 
then you have what's what's left over here. And now G is our um, permanent loads, Q is our imposed loads. And so when we use these, we need to find some way of combining those. And for instance, if we have a building, we need to add them up. But adding is a very sort of funny term you could always say, because for instance, you've got a load on the second floor on a beam, and then you've got a wind load on the top floor blowing horizontally. And we're going to add those together. That's why the addition sign is inverted commons. It just means they're acting together. They are working on the building. You are taking them into account in an analysis. So uh, we're going to now have a look at the STR and SDRP, the structural resistance and the structural, the structural load combination when um, it's just your imposed loads go governs, STR, and STR is when the permanent load governs, STRP permanent. This will be normally governing for concrete. In a concrete structure, it's it's more common that this is important. In a steel structure, it's it's unlikely for this to become um, to govern. Uh, a governing, as in, it's the worst case. But there will be potentially times where maybe you've got a very heavy floor or something that it's carrying. But in most cases, your STR P STR case governs steel design, heavy structures, big silos, thick concrete slabs, etc. That's when the STRP governs, and uh, the way to think about this is you have a load combination plus your imposed load. So, and then you've got, as we're ignoring our pre-stressing in this course, then you have a leading variable and an associated variable. And so what you end up with is that, think about this. This is now, let's say now the uh, all those people in the building. So there's all my people and they are filling the building. And the chance of the maximum wind in 50 years blowing at the same time, the wind load, is fairly small. So I'm not going to say you know, 1.6 times people load plus 1.6 times wind load. That's a bit you know, over conservative. So we have something called a combination factor. That accounts for the probability of the two occurring at the same time. So what is the chance of the worst wind load in 50 years at the same time as the worst, you know, grand opening specials with packed to the ceiling stock. Um, and so you have these combination factors in the same way when the wind blows, let's now you could take the wind as leading and then you could take the grand opening as your, um, uh, your secondary, your associated um, uh, imposed load. And once again, you would have a different combination factor. And often students ask me, which one is leading? And I, the answer is, I don't know, because it depends on which structure you're designing. Any load, any imposed load, a, a crane load, a wind load, an imposed load, any of them could be leading. And so you want to test all of them and find out which is the worst. Sometimes you can just look at it and you'll know. But often you, you don't necessarily know. Often you may not realize just by looking at it. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So you're going to take a bunch of different combinations, come up with almost like a matrix of solutions, and then use that. All right, and then moving on from that, you've got your permanent load, STRP case. And think of this as heavy structure. Want to make sure there's enough factor of safety on imposed load. So normally we'd have around a 1.2 factor for um, imposed, I mean the permanent load, here we've got a 1.35 factor on the permanent, so on the weight of the concrete. That's to give us a little bit of extra factor of safety. Can ima Just imagine if you had a really, really, really heavy concrete structure with very little imposed load. If you used STR, you'd only have a really a 20% factor of safety, which is not quite enough. Whereas this, it, it, it just sort of beefs up the, the partial factor to account for that. And here you'll see you'll only have one um, leading action. So you will only have wind or imposed or crane, not all of them acting at the same time if they're uncorrelated. So just be careful of that you have one at a time. Maximum load of imposed load, um, maximum permanent load plus one or the other. Whereas for the case above STR, you have multiple um, imposed load cases being considered together. And when it comes to using the um, combination factors, they're as listed here. And so you've, you, our normal one is our self-weight. There's our self-weight, 
and then 1.35 str and strp wind 1.6 please make sure you're on the the um the newest wind load code if you've got one of the older versions it might say 1.3 there it's 1.6 now there's lots of fights in industry about that but at the moment it's it's 1.6 um so they used to design with 1.3 and then um yeah so there's a bit of controversy about that but there is good reason why it is 1.6 and then one when it's strp and so this is now for unfavorable 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 that is when it makes the the sort of force in what you are designing worse and always think about what am i designing but let's say now we are designing a column here this column and uh, you've got a load um, coming down the one side what you'll actually find is there's a tension reaction here and so let's say you are now designing a tension force there so this would be an unfavorable for the tension but let's say now we add a force there that's actually favorable that's going to hold it down it's going to reduce the tension in this connection at the top of this beam so there's some funny portal frame as i said and uh, we're designing a tension we would want to, this load to be as low as possible so for an imposed load we just assume it's not there Whereas for a permanent load, you're not going to have no concrete or no steel beams. There you use a sort of 0.9. And you'll see you never get a favorable SDR, um, SDRP case. Um, you just ignore it altogether because uh, that would just be, um, you know, if, if permanent governs, then why would you have an, a favorable permanent load? Okay, moving along. Here are your combination factors. This is how much wind acts when the maximum imposed load is applied and so here you would for instance have let's say now I take my wind load I've got now my wind on a building and uh, I now have 1.2 G plus 1.6 wind plus how much imposed load so I'd have 1.6 times my imposed load and they're acting in all over the show I would have a look well firstly imposed loads for occupancy categories let's say this now looks like a I don't know public area where people may congregate it's a university building or something um, point three I would put that um, factor in there so it'd be 0 0.3 times 1.6 so this would end up being 0 0.48 so you'd have a reduced amount of load on it but now also just be careful the wind load is is very easy to to get wrong um, if you are doing it ultimate limit state it's 1.2 g let's say and 1.6 q plus zero times um, 1.6 wind the zero makes everything disappear so you don't have a wind as an accompanying action in ultimate at ultimate limit state so this is for uls this is for sls serviceability yes you do um, ultimate no so the these combinations are normally what you will use um, in this course so just be sure you you're familiar with those and so as i said now we also have them for for serviceability so what we would do is then start combining them for a serviceability load and so here you would see that it's a similar procedure you have your your, your imposed load, I mean your permanent load, impermanent load, we're going to ignore pre-stressing, imposed load, and then accompanying action. But here your factors are different. 1.1 G, 1.1 times your concrete and steel weight, plus then you've got some load, which is normally 1 um, for imposed load, so 1 Q, plus... Yeah, some amount of, of accompanying action. It's 0.6 for wind. Um, so just be careful. This value, use 0.6. So there is 0.6 when wind is leading. So it's my uh, either worst or best. So it's either 1.1 or 1 um, imposed load plus 0.6 wind. Um, so just, just be careful that. And then re irreversible serviceability is... When something deflects and doesn't come back to where it was at the start. So let's say now you're designing a beam and there is a um, uh, so, uh, some s services or a partition wall or a wall with a glass window in. The beam deflects and the window cracks. 
or the beam deflects and the partition breaks or something gets damaged. That's irreversible serviceability. That's when you actually have to go fix it. It has The structure hasn't failed, but because it deflected, you have to go back and um, you know, fix it up afterwards. Same thing, let's say the roof sags so much that suddenly there's water ponding on the roof, which is a bad thing, that you would have to go back and fix. That's irreversible serviceability. So you would avoid that. And then combination for reversible. Reversible is that when it bends and it just goes back to where it was, there's no, um, uh, yeah, there's no permanent def damage to it. And so when you think about reversible and irreversible serviceability, people often forget serviceability failures. But if you have a look, for instance, at the carports that were outside the general engineering building, they were a great example of a serviceability failure. Uh, yeah, there's, you'll see in the last sort of four years, they've had a number of changes to them. And then they had louvers, and then there was some problem with those, and then they put, I don't know, like shade netting on top of them. What happened is, is it wasn't quite at a slope, so then it just ponded, and you had these huge pools of water that built up. The structure hadn't fallen down. The steelwork was still strong enough, but the it was no longer serving its purpose, so they had to strip that off. And then there was no shade, so it was a sort of a waste of time shade port. Uh, so those were serviceability failures, and eventually then it got fixed up and proper sheeting, and then, then it was fine. So... Those are what serviceability failures may look like. And so how do you know how much deflection something's allowed? Here we're going to have a look at SANS 10160 part 2. So this is your steel code, which you do need a copy of. For instance, if you have a simply supported roof covering. So here's your beam and it supports load and there's some load on it. This is allowed to um, deflect under variable load. So you'd only, for instance, take variable load. Um, of you know, 1 kPa or half a kPa, whatever we're looking at, and divide that, um, the span by 180. So let's say this was a 1.8 meter span, 1.8 divided by 180, and you have a 10 millimeter deflection. That would be what you are allowed to, to deflect. And so a simply span member supporting floors span over 300. And then uh, depending uh, this is industrial buildings, all other types, you'd have a look at these simple span members of floors and roofs supporting construction and finishes susceptible to cracking, so that would be a, a drywall. You'd limit your span to half of that, half of what it was for, for uh, roof coverings. And so L over 360, so a 3.6 meter span floor is only allowed to deflect 10 moles under full variable load, and you'd only take the deflection due to the variable load for this. Um, Okay, so we're going to finish up and then in the next video going on to the next sections.